Recording started. Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and it's Tuesday, April 27th, 2010, and welcome to the Future of Education. Our special guest tonight is Dr. Jackie Gerstein. Welcome, Jackie. Mike, how's my sound? Oh, you're coming through now, but you were off for a second. Yeah, I turned it off. So thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me, Steve. Absolutely. Delighted. I've been looking forward to this quite a bit. The Future of Education is sponsored by my employer, Illuminate. The project I work on is called Learn Central. It's a social network for educators. I hope you'll come and uh, it is free. We hope you come and use it. Coming up in the Future of Education tomorrow night, Anya Kamenetz on DIYU. That should be a lot of fun. And then uh, next week, uh, I'm traveling, so just one show. It's John Taylor Gatto. And this was a name that people didn't seem to recognize, but it should be a lot of fun. He was the New York City Teacher of the Year for a couple of years in a row, and uh, then wrote a book called Dumbing Us Down and became kind of a vocal critic of uh, how schools work. Uh, Leonard Wax uh, walks on May 11th. Charles Fidel in School of Architecture, Think Global School People. Lots more fun coming up, including Kathy Davidson on May 25th. You can see the list there. If you have missed a session, oh darn, where's my slide for the missed sessions? Oh, I must be coming up. Uh, we have started a network called Students 2.0. Jackie's in there. So I'm going to check and turn your mic off just for a minute while you're typing. Uh, Jenny Luca has uh, worked on that as well. I'll get that slide up for the missed sessions. Uh, but come to students20.com. Put the link. Someone could put the link in the chat there. That would be great. Uh, and we're trying to provide a place for students and educators to connect outside of their traditional structures for sort of student-directed learning. We'll see how that experiment goes. Also, we want to encourage you to come to EduBloggerCon on June 26th, all day Saturday. It is free. It will be in Denver in the Convention Center just before the ISTE conference. Uh, it's the social network, a social media and education unconference. It's always a lot of fun. Uh, beginners most welcome, especially for beginners. That same day, we're going to hold an open source con. Same idea, different topic. It'll be on open source software. You're welcome to wander between the two. There, there, hopefully, there will be compelling reasons to be one or the other. And we've just announced in November, the 15th to 19th, we're going to hold a free online global education conference hosted in Illuminate. Multiple time zones, multiple languages, multiple tracks. Should be a lot of fun. Lots of great organizations on board to help, uh, help partner with us on this event. If you missed the session, here we go, Jackie. If you missed the session, like Randy Orwin today on open source implementation, or Dr. Robert Epstein, Epstein, on Team 2.0 yesterday. Uh, they are recorded and they're up for you to listen to. Tim Magner, Michael Horn, Larry Falazzo, Scott Rosenberg, Tony Wagner, Sir Ken Robinson, lots of fun. Lots of, lots of things to listen to if you're so inclined. I am a listener. I do enjoy podcasts. If this is your first time in Illuminate, there are different ways to respond and we'll coach you through it. We won't spend time on this slide right now, but let us know. Obviously, you can put information in the chat. You can clap, smile. And that hand with the green up arrow is how you raise your hand to take the microphone. If you think you want to take the mic, and we hope you will tonight, do go up to Tools, Audio, run the Audio Setup Wizard to make sure your microphone's working correctly. Now you get to tell us where you're listening from. So look for the wand with the red star at the end. Click on that, and then click on the map, and we'll know. And you can shout out in the chat, maybe where you're listening from, time, weather. A North America crowd, but someone down there, I'm not even, I can't even guess where that is, if that's an accurate place. Colorado, New Jersey, Lancaster, PA. Got a couple from Pennsylvania, Arkansas. Glad to have you with us, Tammy. Okay, okay so Jackie, this is you are second in three guest speakers on this subject of students 2.0. 
this has really been a fun week for me. Have you been looking forward to this? I turn my mic back on. Of course. You know, we started talking at um, at Educon, and it's it's just been it's actually been percolating in my head ever since and growing. So it's very exciting. Well, the reason I asked that was because at Educon, I got the feeling that it wasn't the best experience. That you walked away kind of feeling like the message hadn't hadn't fully gotten articulated or been received. Have you thought about that much? Yes, I have. You know, I sent you an email. I think people, when we talked about, I think we're jumping ahead, but that's okay. When we talked about user-generated education, they were thinking of Summerhill. Remember Summerhill, where the kids were allowed to run free and do anything they want. And that's not what this is about. So I think people got a mistaken message that it's totally student directed with no adults involved whatsoever. And that's not what, what I'm perceiving or what even the kids themselves are developing. I'm just feeding off of what they're doing now outside of school and looking at it as an opportunity for them to grow their own educations and because they're doing it anyhow. And they're, they are involving adults. They are choosing their own mentors. So it's not a free for all. I'm really intrigued with how culture changes. Uh, everything from fashions to ideas and how ideas can be in season. And Jackie, I'm going to just ask you to turn your mic off when you're typed in there because it, you know, it does come through. So you'll, you'll turn it back on when you're ready. So I'm really intrigued by this idea of how things kind of change and how ideas, you know, if someone were talking about user-generated education or let's say, you know, Dante Delgado 20 years ago talking about schools as factory style, that somehow enough things have changed that we're more receptive. And I know that personally I go, I've, I've sort of watched myself go through different processes of feeling differently, thinking differently about different issues. So is there something particular about our time right now which is leading us to this idea of user-generated education? Yeah, I think oh, I got some feedback. Thanks. They're do it, it. They're doing it. I mean, I think we kids and young people did it on their own, always by neighborhood groupings and finding kids with like-minding interests. But with the social media and um, ways to connect, they're finding ways. They're finding communities. I just am amazed. You go and you look at Facebook groups or MySpace groups. They're, they are forming learning communities, and I'm calling them now communities of learning practice, and they are all age groups. So we are now at an opportunity. You know, I always think that we talk about student-centric and student-generated education, and now there's the tools and the opportunity to do so. So the culture of, you know, they say technologies, it's not about the tools, but a big part of it is now that we have the tools to provide these communities of learning, these communities of practice that are self the, stu the kids are doing it. They're self. They're self-organizing, and they're learning a lot on their own. I'm kind of intrigued also by the degree to which it feels as though the business community is, uh, in some ways, asking for this. And and I know these folks aren't fully representative of business, but to hear Seth Godin talk, or even to read the introduction of the new John C. Lee Brown book, a poll, it kind of feels as though. There's a there's a perfect storm here, not just of the internet and its capabilities, but also of the expectations of what um, employers are going to want from individuals. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think the gap now is even bigger of what you know what Fortune 500 companies. I know it's not to prepare kids for the workforce, but what they're doing now. I look at Fast Company and watch them online and watching. You know, I went to South by Southwest and what's occurring in in not just business world, but the nonprofit sector is just incredible how people are gathering. You know, the crisis camps when Haiti went on, it's amazing. And the kids are not being even allowed to engage in similar ways in the schools. But it also feels like maybe we're kind of headed in uh, sort of parallel different directions. Um, you know, at one and the same time, the internet is is liberating a lot of creativity, but it's also being clamped down on. Um, in a lot of ways, there's more opportunity. Like we heard last night from Dr. Epstein, you know, for um, 
for, for teenagers to be independent and yet at the same time it feels like more and more laws and our societal perceptions are wanting to infantilize them. So can both things be happening at the same time? Well, they obviously are, aren't they, which is sad. I mean, we talk about every, you know, there's new things. <laughs> See your smiley face. We, we talk about the firewalls at school and, and schools fearing just letting the systems be be open to allow kids to be able to engage that way. It's just, and more of a focus on national standards and kids, you know, that's even growing so that there's more testing going on. Yeah, the freedom does happen outside of school. Derf. So I know you're prepared to take us on a little bit of a web tour. So yeah. shall we do that now? Sure. I was just going to show some things from the wiki that really that that reinforce some of these ideas. I like aggregating. Of course, I like aggregating like-minded people. This first one is a uh, clip from Seth Godin. Did you get him to agree yet? So, uh, I'm sorry. Say that again. Seth Godin. Did you, is he going to come on he yet? He says he's coming on. <laughs> I haven't put him in the list yet, but he says he's going. He doesn't want to do a full hour. He says he doesn't want to do a full hour. Oh, hey, but do, so do you know do you know how to run a web tour? Would you like me to yeah, start? Yeah, I that have up? it. No, I have it okay. on. Good. So so what folks so what you're gonna do to watch it to about three minutes, it should be running for all of you. If not, click on the play button. You have access from your own. And you can make your screens bigger. Thank you for the timer. So you're going to go to about three minutes of his video. Any thoughts on what you heard on the video? Say that again, Jackie. I was just... Get it, trying to get some reaction on the video. So, those of you who, who would like to, if you've seen that video before, listened to it before, why don't you click on the green check or the red X if that was new to you? And, and what did you think? I mean, this is, again, this is one of those cultural messages, Jackie, that's so intriguing to me. I mean, if, if you had said this to me 10 years ago or 15 years ago, I don't think I would have understood it in the same way that I do now. And the discussion of the factory school model and the discussion of consumerism, um, you know, I, uh, does it just take time for these messages to seep in where we begin to, to, have, to shift in our way of thinking? So you talked about um, my thoughts, and I was, um, and what I've been thinking about late, lately. And I was thinking back to my own school experiences, and obviously, way back then, we didn't have all this technology. And um, this is also related to what the educator's role is in, in user-generated education. And I have been thinking about this for the last 20 years as an educator. And now it's just like you're saying, maybe it is a a perfect storm and and I was thinking about I was in experiential education and I wouldn't even enter the public school systems as an educator for a long time because I didn't agree with their philosophy and tenets and and love John Dewey from being an undergrad and now we're having John Dewey would love the opportunities we're providing in in this culture in this perfect storm and so when I was thinking back at my own school experiences and the role of a teacher when it comes to user-generated education, uh, K-12 was a pretty much a blur for me and it was painfully boring because I was being directed in my learning when I did want to be self-directed. And the, the example I use um, for one of the teachers who knew how to do this communities of practice, this communities of learning without the tech, I, she saw I had a book of plays. I loved to read and would bring books to class and hide them in textbooks because I was so bored. And she saw that and gave me this huge book of plays in 10th grade. And she said, why don't you perform it this for the class? And here I gathered my stoner friends and we were performing Chekhov and Albie 
Albert Alby to a group of, of classmates because she saw that I was interested in something and said, here, go for it. I'll just give you the opportunity. And so what we're having now, so I don't think it's necessarily changed for me. What I think is now it's just we're, we're, we have so much opportunity. This is so, such an exciting time so that that English teacher can now be Skyped and we can have, today I watched um, Carl Fish, Fish um, they had four ninth grade classes interviewing Daniel Pink. Um, uh, they all, ninth graders read Whole New, Mi whole New Minds and was asking Daniel Pink questions for two hours that he was responding to. I mean, so now we're bringing it into the classroom and for for educators not to take advantage of these communities of practice, these communities of learning verges on unethical practice in my perspective. So one of the cup that was my I had to do right. it so far. Well, one of my one of the comments <laughs> in the chat I think maybe gives some um, some help here in understanding. Uh, you know, the question would be is is part of the fear just because we don't know then what the new model is, that uh, we don't have a handbook, we don't have an easy set of practices to fall back on, so it scares us because it's uh, it's new and unknown? Was it really that new and really that unknown? That's my, that's my comment here. Maybe it's just what we're used to. And then if we look at these 33 people here tonight, we're here for a reason, future of education, and we're here for for educational reform. So maybe it's just what we're used to as opposed to what we don't know. I think we do know it at heart, but are kind of just get used to the system that we've evolved in, if that's making sense to you. Absolutely. And, well, and Cass says this sort of the same thing. I think teachers don't want a handbook of scripted lessons that came to many of us with no child left behind. Yeah. But it's still the question of do we uh, do if 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 we move to this idea of user generated education for those of us who've done some homeschooling, I think we kind of understand the path. But if you don't understand the path, wouldn't you just sort of feel a little bit lost? Was there a path? I missed that question. Say again. What is the path? Well, at least for me, it was uh, as we progressed through with our oldest daughter, who did a great books program. Uh, we we were able to watch how she kind of took control of her own learning, and she was deeply engaged. It's sort of a scholar phase, and so I have some mental image of what that's like, and I can feel some comfort because of it. But if you haven't, if that hasn't been a part of your model. Can you even imagine that? I mean, if you think about how we typically think of teens, aside from what we heard last night, you know, wouldn't you say, I, I can't imagine that being possible? Keep going. I'm, I'm chewing over what you're saying, so keep going. Well, I don't know that I'm saying anything of significance, but I'm just <laughs> yes, I'm, in, I'm interested in uh, the difficulty of adopting this mindset. And you come at it, I think, because that's the kind of student you were, and you you really wanted that freedom. Uh, and yet, most educators, uh, you know, I would I has I tentatively say maybe the great majority of educators would have a hard time imagining just how this would take place. Well, that's when I think that's when communities of learning like we're doing here. We, we know that educators are notoriously isolated and that if we do change, the chat's going back by fast, if we do start changing that we're communities and that's what I, I, I engage in Twitter and Learn Central and webinars and I, I get ideas there too. But I think we have to come from our core values. Why did we become educators? What we have the best interests of students at heart, and I think some of that, and it says a lot, is letting go of control and looking at how we become more facilitators of learning resources. Um, I call it tour guides of learning possibilities. So I, I think the core values are there, and it's sometimes letting go of what we're used to and trying to get back to what those core values are because sometimes the system gets us confused because of we keep throwing up these messages that kids need to get high test scores and need to be controlled in the classroom and need to be quiet and and need to have their desks faced a certain way. So it's it's really changing not our values but some of our practices. 
if that's making sense. Absolutely. I'm, I'm also thinking about what, what I'm imagining would be pretty strong pressures from administrators and parents to keep doing things the way they've been done. Well, parents need to be educated too because they're coming from a, the same paradigm as when they were students, so they expect the test grades. So, so it's, it's a switch. I mean, it's a switch for everybody. So can you paint a little bit of a picture of, of how you think user-generated user education could be done? Give us the, the three-minute uh, kind of blue the sky the picture. Movie, you mean? <laughs> the hook to get the feature film produced. <laughs> um, it, it it's happening, Steve, and we know it. I mean, that's why students 2.0 are happening. I mean, look at that. Maybe somebody in the chat knows that kid who's organizing the little red wagon kid, who's now walking across the United States raising money for the homeless. Um, so kids are doing it. I mean, it's pretty exciting. The the TEDx teen kids that are, the, the, there was a woman there, I forgot her name, maybe somebody knows in the chat, who who at 17 started a, a global rights for women and now the website is like, it's amazingly huge in all these countries. So I mean, it's happening and I think we just have to connect people to what, as it ha it's connection, it's network learning, it's connected learning. So it's out there and it's happening and I know what what really resonated with me, I'm kind of going on, on an offshoot because you said it, and I, that's the one thing I've been thinking about, is maybe educational change is going to have to occur outside of the system. And that, that part you mentioned to me at Educon, and that's the one thing I've been thinking about a lot. So maybe you could, because I did want this to have your ideas too, because you're they're, they're interesting to me too, so maybe you could talk about that part. Yeah, well, I always hesitate to be the guy talking. I'm much more comfortable. I in know, the and I am, and I'm more comfortable asking questions too. So. Well, I have. No, I mean, this goes along with the theory from disrupting class, and Michael Horn and Clay Christensen, and I also think uh, that first video on your. I don't know if you were going to show the first video on your wiki. But there's actually, you know, uh, Alvin Toffler, where he's waiting for Bill Gates to say the the words, um, you know, we need to not reform education, but to replace it. Isn't it? I'm not sure I have that correctly. I have that correct. I'll grab that quote. Right. I turned off my mic. So, for a so Cass, this is this is really interesting to me because I think we hear this a lot. Uh, there are issues of scale and equity. And, and typically, scale and equity become very difficult to address when you're talking about new educational models. So I think that's a very real concern. Uh, and I'm not sure it's a rationale for keeping the system the way it is, because I'm not sure that we do a good job with equity right now or that things have scaled well. But I do know that those are the, the kinds of things that, um, that do get brought up. So Cass, I don't know if you're comfortable taking the mic, but I'd love to hear your take on that. I'm sorry. Uh, what were you asking me to comment on? Well, just your comment. Uh, you had talked about. Um, right, I'm going to turn your just turn your mic off just for a second. I'll give it back to you because we're getting an echo. But you had talked about um, how you would scale. Um, that only the the you're worried about changing outside the system is that only the children whose parents are knowledgeable get the good change. The others are left in the same mess. So how do we address the issue of wanting scale and equity, of wanting educational opportunities to be equal, when they're probably not very equitable today, but we do worry that if we implement different ways of doing things, that it will be hard to do it consistently across the board. And does that become another argument for change at the fringe? Yeah, I'll turn your mic back on to respond. So I have had the opportunity to, for the past seven years, we started opened a new school in our town that is a K-8 public school. And had our main goal was to first start with a community service, our community, uh, a customer service statement. And that was something new to just change the whole look of the school. And then the second thing is we have always been um, out to prove everyone wrong 
because our school is um, very high poverty, very um, high diversity for our town, and um, very low socioeconomics. So our goal was to prove everyone wrong. And because of that, um, and the different things we've done, uh, we've been able to play the game of test scores, and ours have gone well. So they've let us open up our sandbox a little bit more and try things that are much more creative than the regular classroom. But it takes a really strong leader who has power downtown. And Cass, I turned your mic off again just so we don't get the echo. I think we heard that, if, if those of you who might have been in the, um, might have listened to the Michael Horn recent study on Wichita Public Schools, kind of intriguing how the, the, the what is now seen as a very successful program took a really strong effort of some individuals to bring it into being. So is that just kind of the new model, the looking for linchpins, people, uh, to use Seth Godin's phrase, people who are willing to kind of go out on a limb and make something happen that is positive? Cass, if you wanted to take the mic back, you're welcome to. I did turn your mic off, so you have to turn it back on if you want to talk. I just wanted to say that I think that you have to start that way. You have to um, prove that this thinking where we put students in the driver's seat and they guide their learning, we have to prove that it's working. And we have to prove it on the playing field on which we're being assessed statewide knowing that that playing field really doesn't show all of the great things our students are achieving. An example of that is about three years ago, our school districts that decided that any child below grade level in reading should get no social studies or science. Our building as a group decided that was not OK. And so we adapted, wrote for Gantt grants, redid our schedule. And I believe that that one decision has been one of the things that's been able to help our students be incredibly successful on the, in the testing game, but more importantly, incredibly successful with the type of learning they've had and the experiences they've had. So Cass, how have you um, implemented uh, student involvement? Uh, student involvement in their learning decisions we still play the game of following the district-wide schedule. Every fifth grade teacher or every grade level better be teaching um, the same content area at the same time. So it gets a bit tricky. But with my students, what we do is have them, in my classroom at least, and in most of my buildings, show us what you know. So good, we don't have to teach that, even though it's listed. And um, then we also have the students pick different ways to demonstrate what they know, pick uh, different mentors for subjects in which they're interested, doing a lot of collegiality with teachers at different grade levels and different expertise. Um, my students talked me into, which is another way for saying they led, my fifth grade is putting on Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, May 18th. I'm terrified. They don't seem to be worried at all. Um, they are totally in charge of it. I just sit there and shake my head. So it's about proving to the people who are making the decisions right now that we can play their game, but we can also do it in a way that allows students to have a big say about how they're doing the learning. So Jackie, I think you were in the session last night with Dr. Epstein. And it didn't come up in the interview. But in his book, he has this long section about uh, the programs that have been really successful for youth who, who are in trouble. Uh, and they're often sent to, to special camps or schools or ranches. And uh, he makes the case that pretty universally, the ones that do a really good job of helping these youth are the ones where they actually put the youth in charge or in important roles right away and actively involve them. So is there a, is, are you seeing any kind of a community or network of people who are doing this in education who are talking with each other and sharing ways, like Cass has mentioned, of actively involving the youth in their education? 
No, but that's what I see the problem as I used to do. I used to work with, uh, brought back memories, at-risk youth and took them at, uh, on wilderness trips. And these are pretty hardcore kids, kids who um, had some major felonies under their belt and our whole model. So thanks, actually, that's where I, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, and what it came from an outward bound model, I don't know if people are familiar here with outward bound, and that's actually where I've been thinking lately, how to connect this outward bound, um, real real esteem building, self, self um, governing, self learning, and to combine that with what we're doing with communities of practice and online, because what would happen is we'd have these groups when there was problems and they'd be self-governments if some kid acted out and the kids would problem solve and the eventual the eventual idea was that the instructors would step out and the kids would run their own groups everything from cooking the meals to setting up camps to problem solving and it was pretty powerful because the kids did take responsibilities it almost was and that's what I think we're missing um, a rites of passage and so how do we create that for, I think, if you talk especially about teens and teens 2.0, how then do we create this model where kids can have a rite of passage? Because, like I said, those ninth graders today interviewing Daniel Pink had amazing questions. And he was, he was, they were having this discourse with Daniel Pink that was absolutely incredible. You'd think that they were folks in their 20s having these discussions. So. Again, I think they're happening in little pockets, but how do we make this the norm rather than the exception is the question. Jackie, because I'm just gonna, I was just going to tell you, I'm going to turn on the uh, teleconference bridge because Marianne was trying to get on. So just don't click that cancel button. I'll let this go ahead and connect. If anybody's having trouble hearing the session, they can um, dial in and hear it through the teleconference bridge. So um, are, are there? I mean, I'm thinking of uh, Montessori schools. Aren't there schools that actively involve the students in helping care for the school? I'm seeing if anybody answers in the chat. Does anyone know? And and then I guess my next question is: uh, Are there ways for people doing this to connect with each other currently? Are there good ways to be able to share stories and to sort of collect? And who's you know who's speaking to this audience and how is this audience gathering? I think that what we're having trouble with, and I keep promoting, asking for this, is that people are doing amazing things within their pockets and. Like last year, I was working with third through fifth grade gifted kids, and they did some amazing online projects. And what we're not doing is, and they worked with a class from Illinois, and they worked with another class from Turkey, and they they were creating their own web pages and projects on their own. I just was again providing some some side guidance to them. And how what I'm finding is that educators aren't documenting their best practices. And so we're not hearing the success stories. We're hearing about test scores, but people are doing these amazing things. And I only hear about them through some of these webinars or through ISTE. Or and and why aren't they becoming the norm? And why aren't why aren't you know it becoming? When I was doing it in my school, I was one of the few teachers who used tech. And again, we were we were interacting with a class from Turkey, and no one in the district cared, even though they knew I was doing it. And these are things that people, I think, um, I forgot who said it, but we should be doing self-promotion and documenting and putting these out to the mainstream, not just going to NEC and, and EDUCON and, and talking about it, but going to mainstream conferences and saying, look what CAS going to these conferences and saying, look what we're doing with our class and look at how successful it is, not only with test scores in the mainstream type of way, but look at, let's hear the kids' testimonials and let's see their work and their passion. So. Do, is there ever a sense that this is kind of tilting at windmills? And I'm interested maybe in hearing Tammy Moore speak up. Uh, and, and are there people who just kind of leave the system and say, you know, I'm going to do this at home because it just not, it's not going to happen in my lifetime in schools? So we are asking for you to raise your hand or take the mic. I don't know, Tammy, if you're uh, 
still there listening, but we'd love to hear your kind of take on this. Looks like Tammy dropped off. Yeah, yeah she's raising her hand. Oh, no, sh there we go. Sorry, Tammy. You have the mic? Hey, it just popped up at the top, is all. <laughs> um, yeah, we've been homeschooling for about 16 years, and we started back at a time when homeschooling was so new that you couldn't get textbook publishers to sell to you hardly at all. I think Abeka had only been selling to homeschoolers for a year or two, Bob Jones only for a year or two, but for the most part, those who started out in those early days of homeschooling had to pretty much fend for themselves. And when you can't get a hold of textbooks, you get pretty creative from the very beginning. And if you can imagine if suddenly all the textbooks disappeared from schools, how would it change the culture in the schools if all of a sudden now the students had to go out and get the information for themselves and come up with how to do it? Um, some of the things that we've done in our home school um, is when my oldest kids started getting the middle school age range, and that's coming into that preteen, teen age range. And the, the entire summer was completely in their hands, except for mathematics. We did keep that one structured. But the entire summer was for them to spend in one very, very large project. And they had to come up with it on their own. And uh, my daughter, as an example, my daughter at the time was interested in creating computer games. And so she modded, and this was back before mods were, were hardly out. I think the very first mod was Tomb Raider, and she had that one. And she took the Tomb Raider game, and at the time she was really into, what's the one with um, oh Mulder and Scully? What's that show? I'm sure you guys, somebody here, X-Files. Oh, okay, X-Files. She was really into X-Files. So she spent the whole summer, she, re she watched the shows, she got online, she found the scripts, studied the style, created her own story to use with the modding. And she took, she got images of the characters. She modded the the characters that were in the game to look like Sculler, Scully and Mulder. And she even examined how they're uh, in the 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 TV series what Mulder's apartment looked like. And she created uh, lights and all kinds of things to go into it. Now this was stuff. The, the point is not to just go into this one big project, but the point is these were things way beyond my skill level. I had no idea how to do any of that stuff. So when the kids take on these really big projects, they have to go outside of the source of their direct supervising instructor, which would have been me in the instance. And they really learn a lot. How do you find the information? How do you go out? And they get really creative with it when they realize it's their whole project. They're not waiting for you to check off on the approval. You know, we started out, the, all, every project we've ever done, and I'm, I'm focusing on the summer ones because they were so big, but even during the school year, we would do smaller scale one, and that was actually what we did for school. For instance, uh, we might have a topic where uh, we were working on density for a week. And we would go into every single, every single angle you could possibly come at with density and really dig in. And then when the kids were done, they had to document their learning. We did e-notebooks is what we called them. And they're very web page-like, but that was back before the internet was really very user-friendly for you to put stuff out on the web. Um, and so they would document it. Pictures would be taken of them doing the various hands-on stuff that they did. They'd have to write up what they did, what they learned. It was entirely in their hands. And that's, I think that's what's helpful. You, you, if you took textbooks out, if you get it to where the kids are learning things that even the instructor directly over them, they don't know how to do it, then the kids really suddenly take complete charge of what they're doing. And because it's something they've got some interest in, they take off. So, okay, I, th I think I've, I don't want to dominate, but I think that's enough to, to kind of get an idea. So, Jackie, when we homeschooled our oldest daughter, which happened starting in about fourth grade, we felt an enormous amount of social pressure not to do so. In fact, a, a lot of our friends thought we were kind of crazy. Um, but to what degree are you seeing this in homeschooling? And obviously, homeschooling is not universal. You got cut off. The last part of your question. Is there still audio? We lost Steve. I think you all can still hear me, yes? Great. I'm, again, I think it's 
the informal learning. I mean, even kids were saying, the kids today, talking to Daniel Pink, were saying how boring school was. They see a PowerPoint or a video, they have to memorize and take a test, and that it's a total waste of time. I was saying the same thing when I was a kid. In fact, um, I had to take the practice too, and I think because I'm switching states and want to keep my teaching license, and I could not believe the two hours I spent on Saturday taking these standardized test questions, which is the content that elementary students are learning, and I was appalled, actually. I was bored with it. I just hung in there, and they're, they're learning that stuff every day. And so what the kids are saying is they're bored, and they're not learning. I've been saying that. But now it's 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 the gap is so huge because they get out of school and they they turn on their they turn it to their computers they turn in their mobile devices they Google information when they want it and they're engaged and it's it's like to to ask them to power down when they step into school is is ridiculous I mean I just I'm just appalled at that and I don't think it's getting all that better. I know there are restrictions and schools are scared and, and you know the bullying like that poor girl who hung herself a couple weeks ago. The, these incidents create this fear based the current that permeates the school system that sends us back. You know things happen and it's bad and, but that means we use, need to take opportunities to teach kids and again my model is not I don't you know I put in a Chugok link before and it's about why do we even have kids in grade levels? Why aren't they in competency levels? You know, I was slowed down in math when I could have been through with math or had advanced math by ninth and tenth, but I tried a foreign language and should have been in basic foreign language for years. So why aren't we organizing by competency, by interest, by by um, this idea of age, even age level? What, why are kids put into the same grades? I was looking at Monica, what Monica put in. Well, like I said, Chugok did it, and it, they won the first, what was it? Mo, Motorola, they were the first school ever. Are you guys familiar with the Chugok model in Alaska? It was pretty interesting. Let me get it back up again. This happened years ago, and it had nothing to do with technology. What happened was that this this huge um, I'm pulling it up. This huge school district took off took up a a lot of um, geographical distance. Their students were doing terribly in school, and so what they did is say, we need to throw this out this model and start from scratch. This was a public school system. And what they did was gather gather parents, community members, and students together and said, what should we do? And they bought the, the community members developed their model from the ground up. And it's standards based and it, it, it includes the normal math, English, those type of standards, but it also includes cultural standards and social skills. And kids go through a competency model. And they have this portfolio that travels with them. They get learning style interests, so that so the teacher gets to, the kids go to the next teacher, and the, there's a portfolio of their learning style interests, their competencies, and they don't go to the next competency until they master that. So they're not even separated by age groups. They're they're with 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 kids of the same skills. So Jack, so it's so it's a real. Go ahead. So, uh, I thought you were gone, I, so I was bad. It turns out I had <laughs> pressed against the mute button on my headset. Uh, so I'm, it seems to me there's this fascinating set of parallel circumstances. And how much of this is a confusion between obedience and discipline? Because it feels as though what you've just described, the community coming together and defining the educational process, really relates to the adults in the process also being active participants and being able to self-direct. And is there this, this sort of a larger set of parallel levels at which we've, we've been thinking we were doing discipline, but we were really doing obedience? 
or we thinking we were doing rigor, but we were really doing obedience. And so the students are expected to obey the teachers. The teachers are expected to obey the administrators. The administrators are, are obeying whatever the larger culture is. And that to break out of that actually requires breaking out at each of those levels. Yes. <laughs> I was trying to remember a quote I just heard the other day. Rigor, don't confuse rigor with, it was about math, with understanding. That was it, and that, that's huge for me. I think we do, we separate, we think bigger is the same as understanding and it's not. And again, it's breaking and how do we do this? I've been talking about this. John Gatto, when you have him on, I know I'm going to put a plug for him. He's been saying this for years. I read him 10 years ago because again, I've been thinking about, I, when I was 18, I said, if I had one wish in this world, it would be to change the educational system because we do more kids a disservice than a service because we break their spirits. And that, that, I think, is the biggest ethical travesty we do in schools today. We make them obedient, we, and they become obedient, but what is the, at what cost? And, and what, same thing with teachers, you ask that. I see teachers who the same thing, they're asked to be obedient. I, I can't, I'm doing student teaching observations in one of the primary schools. I've never seen anything. They, were, they had poor test scores. The first graders are curriculum to death. They have canned curriculums from the morning, from their reading and math, and no recess. These kindergarten, these kindergartens and first graders get no recess. And the first grade teacher said the same thing. She's allowed no more creativity. So, so what, do, what, what cost? What is the long-term cost? And that scares me. And this is another, another. <laughs> I'm reading the. I was reading the chat. Um, yes, Cass. Well, what cost? We're losing good teachers. We have kids who can't, who can't, who don't like to read because they're being tested to death. I mean, it's pretty amazing. And they get passionate about learning when they run from the schools at three o'clock. That's when their true learning begins. There's something wrong with the picture. When most of our kids learn at more after school, thanks, Kathy, than they do in in school. Because now they have the tools to do it. Go ahead. I, ha I, I was going to give Kathleen the mic since I'm reading an email from her. All right, she just let her sent, do it. And let her give a plug for her book. All right, please do. So Kathleen, do you know how to use the mic here? Just click on the larger mic button in the audio area to turn your microphone on. Is that me? We can hear you loud and clear. Great. Well, it's really not about giving me the mic and the book the, the mic, but um, but the conversation the mic. When you start to involve kids in the conversation about what it takes to get really good at something, then there you have them investigating what how they got to be so good at the things they're so passionate about outside school, and then that helps them uh, transfer that that kind of analysis, which they're very capable of doing, to the things that they're doing in school. And then they have wonderful critiques of what they're doing in school, both positive critiques when people are doing projects with them and, and real wor world learning, and, and really quite um, incisive critiques about things like whether homework, in fact, is deliberate practice. So that's all I'll say, but we're starting a conversation about this at firesinthemind.org, and that's the conversation is what's important to us. The book is kind of a, a record of that conversation, which we've done in something called the Practice Project in the last couple of years. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so sounds like we have another okay, so event coming up, Kathleen, when we get you on board. So I did get your email on the previous one, and I'm sorry, I'm so buried. I haven't done a good job of responding, but I, I will, I promise. Okay, so Jackie, we've only got eight more minutes. Was, it, was there anything else you wanted to show us from the wiki? Um, no, I'll just put it in, but I just want to build off of what Kathleen said, and then Colleen wants to talk. Um, so what? let me go back to the beginning statement. So what, what, and build off what Kathleen said. So what this means for educators, user-generated education, is not, again, letting the kids go free reign. It's becoming part of the community of learners with them. And if we look at the research, that her name was Mimi Ito. I think I'm saying it right. I apologize to her, even though she's not here if it doesn't. And the Mark Arthur Foundation, that kids do want adults in their communities as mentors. 
So that becomes, we become co-learners with them as well as mentors because we do have more life experiences. And that's where they get the skills. So a kid who's interested in baseball, that's where we introduce, well, let's look at the math because you need to understand a batter's average. So this kid who may not have been interested in math, that's when we introduce other skills and have them go beyond just a narrow way of seeing that interest. So that becomes our role is saying, hey, let's look at it from a different angle. Here's some other resources. And it becomes an invitation rather than nobody wants to be told you have to learn this. And then we're telling kids to do that every day. And it's, it's contrary to how the brain works. So that was, that's another soapbox. Oh, no, I can tell you that some of the best discussions I've had with our children in the last couple of months have been around the uh, authors who've come to talk about their books. Uh, we talked at length about the talent code, uh, about the element, uh, and you know, just this weekend talked a great deal about Teen 2.0. And, and I will tell you, my own children, if they're an example of this, responded so positively to this sort of engaged discussion about student learning. And, and that was not new to us because of our homeschooling experience and just because our kids are um, energetic. Um, but it was a reminder of just how much they want to be a part of those conversations. Kathleen, I can't wait to ask you about your connection with the Talent Code, if you've read it and if, you're, if your research shows similar material. Uh, but we've got about five minutes left, so if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand and we can give you the mic. Colleen, did you want to take the mic? Are you being shy or you don't uh, have a microphone? Okay, so Colleen has left a, a link in the chat to a student project. Is there anyone else who'd like to make a comment? This has been a really fun week for me, and I'm uh, Jackie, I've really appreciated your um, spending time with me at Educon and kind of talking through this. Okay, Tam, we're going to give the mic back to Tammy. Can you go, Tammy? I promise I won't talk too long. I, I think if we, if we work on making sure the kids have knowledge of how to do the tools, one of the things that I see in a lot of the students that work through the virtual homeschool group is that they're really excited about creating stuff, but a lot of them don't know how to have the tools to create it. For instance, you will have peop will have students who want to create a great presentation, but they don't know how to to get the images that they want. Or they'll have we'll have kids that, that want to create a web page or a video. I think a lot of it, if we focus more on giving them the tools so that they can take what they want to learn and go to the next level, because learning the content really isn't that hard. Content's all over the place, especially now nowadays with the internet. Content's out there like crazy. What the kids are really lacking are the tools to be able to take that content and make it their own and turn it into something that that's very much who they are. They don't, you don't, the kids don't want to read a bunch of articles and then write an essay because it's still in the same form. It's almost like you're just rehashing what somebody else has already done. But a student that can take what they're learning out on the internet and be able to create, to really move forward, or maybe you might have one that's more into debate and they might want to go that way, but giving them the tools to take the content into the next level, creating, debating, mm, the higher level thinking skills that go beyond just memorizing a lot of stuff. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think this idea of we have a society of producers more than ever, as, as it used to be a society of consumers, and that fit with the factory model, that fit with students in the school system. We, we were told to be consumers, but now with the allowance of all these tools, we become producers. And like you said, Tammy, people are now having even more opportunity to pick the tools that they choose to produce with. And we're not letting kids produce anymore. Um, we're not letting kids produce in schools. And we're asking them to just fill in dots on sheets and do, do prescribed work and, and, and that includes being producers. And I think the producers are what, what are going, who are going to be successful in life, not just in workforce, but in life because we are about production now. Thanks, Kathleen.
So last night, Dr. Epstein uh, kind of tempered his statement that he'd felt before that the technology would really level the playing field and allow for greater youth participation. And I think in part because he was seeing technologies evolve that are that are highly um, um, in, uh, I'm, not, I'm not getting the word here, but um, you know the, the technology in the car that records everything that happens so the parents know exactly everything that's going on with their kids. Uh, did you get that same sense from him last night, Jackie, that he was no longer as positive about the technology kind of leveling things? I don't know if I, I got that. Uh, do you feel long-term? I didn't long -term hear him talk about that a lot. Go ahead. What were you gonna say? Well, so do you feel long-term that, that in a lot of ways the participant aspects of the web are really going to help shift this model? It already has, Steve. I mean, look at us. We're from all over the place sitting in this room together tonight. Look at today that I got to watch 110 ninth graders asking Daniel Pink questions for two hours. It already has. So I don't know what it's going to look like. I think we might be meeting in 3D virtual worlds for online learning in a few years or are with augmented reality. That's what's so cool. And the kids are going to be producing that. They are. They are. Like I said, it's. I'm just I'm just feeding off what they're doing naturally. You know, we don't fight just like I forgot that martial art where you don't fight the current, you go with it and you use it. The kids are using it. Does anybody know that martial art that you use the energy? I'm looking in the chat. But that's what we're that's what we're I've always said that. Yeah, thank you. Tai Chi. <laughs> or is it a keto? It might be a keto. Um <laughs> sorry. But you use the energy. They're they're bringing that energy. We've lifted several martial arts. <laughs> Maybe it's a combination of them all. But that's what I'm saying. Let's just take what they're using because they're learning at such a rate. I learned, I've learned so much, and Durf and I have said we're both addicted to information. I see her at every one of these um, and every one of these webinars. Look at I go on weekends and hear everybody folks over 30 fo folks are on an evening on their off time. We're doing it. And it's so exciting, and I, I wake up and thank, I'm thankful that I get to go. and can, I've met people from Australia that I met in person. I mean, I met them on Twitter and Second Life, and then I meet them at ISTE conferences in person. Look at the era we're in. It's so exciting, and we're not bringing that into the schools. There's something wrong there. Because we're doing it, the kids are doing it, and the schools aren't. So, I mean, it's happening. And like you said, maybe I don't. I hope it comes within the schools. I think free education in the United States is an amazing gift that we give our kids, but it needs to match what's going on outside of school. Okay, Jackie, that's a great place to stop. Yeah, I know we're over time. We're, we're at our we're at the top of the hour. <laughs> I do want to express Thanks. appreciation to Jackie for coming on tonight. Uh, really appreciate the message and the and the friendship. Uh, thanks to Illuminate Learn Central and Sea Bloom and Associates for their their book budget. Uh, coming up tomorrow night, Anya Kamenet on DIYU. Next week, John Taylor Gatto. We hope uh, and lots more fun. So thanks for coming tonight, Jackie. I'm clapping. Thanks to the rest of you for joining in and for the good conversation. The recording will process tonight, and I'll get it up. And it will be at uh, futureofeducation.com at Learn Central within about an hour. Uh, sure, a lot of fun. Jackie, what's next? Where do we meet up next? Getting the link for Schools 2.0. We need to get kids involved in this project is where we need to meet up. Too many adults, not any kids. Jinx. Okay, everybody, I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, please meet us up, meet up with us at Students 2.0 uh, or FutureOfEducation.com. We'll keep the conversation going. If you can make it tomorrow night, it should be fun as well. Have a great evening. <laughs>